can't have capitalism without capital. You can't have capital without savings. And you can't have savings unless interest rates are high enough to encourage people to save money. What are the interest rates in Europe and around the world? Near zero. They've got a cute uh, term for it. Zero interest rate policy. Zerp. Looks very sexy. Zerp. Called zerp. Sounds like like the zipper. Called zerp. Sounds like like the zipper. Called zerp. Sounds like like the zipper. We'll crooked bankers. We'll do whatever they want to do. And IBM is no sweetheart company. You know, going you know going back to World War II, of course. Uh, you know the story. They they came up with the calculating machines to create the serial numbers on the prisoners uh, in the concentration camps. And Boeing, of course, is a uh, you know war profiteer. So here you've got a war profiteer, Boeing, and uh, a disgraced uh, computer megalopolis, IBM, who were upset that regulators might impose a cost to their borrowing. Because right now they can borrow for zero. How many of you hold standard anymore? This was an experiment. This had never been done before. We're floating on a sea of currency swapping. And the values change minute by minute. And we got rid of that barber's relic, gold. And this experiment uh, started and it unleashed a 30 year reign of terror by what we now call derivatives. But derivatives, you know, you go back to what a derivative is. A derivative, first of all, how many people, if I asked you what a derivative is, could give me, could give me an answer, you know, could explain it in, 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 you know, two sentences or three sentences. Okay, one guy, that's good. <laughs> all right, so let me tell you what a derivative is, and this should kill in 60 minutes. <laughs> I'm mean, at the bar. So, all right. Uh, no, well, derivative, uh, clearly, the, uh, if you look at the word, derive, uh, where does it derive? It's a value, it's, it, it's a value that's derived from something else. Now, it, that all goes back to what's called the option price and volatility formula, which was got a Nobel Prize winning formula, uh, Black Scholes and those guys of, that, of the 70s came up with this idea that you could trade options on an exchange based on this formula because they figured out a way to price an option that was quote unquote out of the money. In other words, if you buy an option on the house, you know kind of what the house is worth and the option therefore is tied to the house and you, you kind of get an idea what that option would be worth. But how about an option tied to a stock that's constantly changing in value that may or may not get to 50 or 60 points above or below where the current price is. Well, you need this secret formula that you apply and you come up with a price. And if everyone says, yeah, we go with the formula, you can create the Chicago Board of Options Exchange and have four options primary exchanges in the US and you can trade options on stocks all day long and it's a huge business. And speculators made money. People who own stocks could hedge their stocks, there is some practical application to it. But then during the 80s, when Reagan came in, Reagan, uh, Alan Greenspan, and Robert Rubin, ex-Goldman Sachs guy, the Troika, they started to make it possible to make derivatives that were traded on top of derivatives. So now that separation or that connection to anything real got very unreal. And they started trading, of course, we know in the 80s, the whole leverage buyout scene and the junk bond scene and all of the uh, Mike Milken and all of the, the innovation that went on at the time. We were told that financial innovation can replace jobs. You don't need farmers, we don't need truck drivers, we, just, we need financial engineers. Everyone can be a trader and contribute to the GDP. And the way we're gonna facilitate this is we're going to deregulate and create more derivatives on top of more derivatives. In the UK, 1987 under Margaret Thatcher, they had the Big Bang, which was essentially the repeal of the law that connected investment banks and commercial banks where people keep their savings, their deposits. And of course, uh, this is a repeal of something that was in the States going back to the 30s, the Glass-Steagall Act, which was created after the 1920s 
And what were the 1920s all about? The 1920s were all about derivatives. Why did the stock market crash? It's all about derivatives. JP Morgan was there then. They created these blind pools at that time. All these blind pools were owned and cross-owned by each of these banks, owning each other's and marking up prices based on their own internal valuations without any public oversight, without any public scrutiny. And so one day, like Enron, somebody said, wait a minute, this is not an $80 billion company. This stock's worth zero. And the stock collapsed and went to zero. And there's 700 off-balance sheet special purpose entity funds held billions of debt that had to be priced, which means the equity got wiped. And uh, by the way, speaking of corrupt Irish bankers, the word on the street in the press, right, is that the country's got 80 billion in bad debts. That number is out of my ass. Okay? <laughs> By any reasonable estimate, the number is closer to 500 billion. We're talking three times GDP. It's not marked to market. It's held in NAMA. What the hell is a NAMA? It's Vietnam. <laughs> They won't price it to market, because if they do, it means the entire bond market collapses and the entire country is completely <laughs> bankrupt. So they keep it on the books, they keep paying the interest, they keep rolling these things, they keep the propaganda rolling. Why? Because they think the housing market's gonna come down, come back someday. And of course, people are saying, you know, even today, I'm amazed, just walking around the streets, you know, you meet somebody, hey Max, how's it going? Yeah, I see you on the show. What are you up to? And they'll say, hey, you know what, Max? Now's a good time to buy. <laughs> I say, what? <laughs> yeah, now, now's a good time to buy. It's bottomed. <laughs> Housing's bottomed. You gotta buy. Sad truth is that housing hasn't bottomed. Housing hasn't bottomed here. It hasn't bottomed anywhere. In the world. Sludge from Wall Street. Let's take a look and see what it's worth. You can't do it. For national security. VV should you let you want to defend the terrorists of one? Well, in point of fact, there's nothing in the vaults of the Federal Reserve of resale value. And uh, let me just give you, a, let me digress from my dis digression and digress a little. A uh, story from a week ago turns out that the financial crash, uh, crash started in 2007 got rolling in 2008, tripped the financial Armageddon melt meltdown, uh, was set in motion by Wachovia Bank in the United States, who was, they've paid a fine for this. Uh, they were laundering hundreds of billions of Mexican drug cartel money. The authorities came in and they said, we're gonna shut this operation down. The Mexican drug cartels pulled the plug on the operation. The only real source of capital in the global capitalist system, the spigot, had been turned off. That is drug money. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. Hence, the liquidity crisis, otherwise known as the insolvency crisis. And then two years later, it turns out that, and this is reported, check it out, Google it or whatever, the 2008, Henry Paulson goes to Congress and says, we're on the verge of Armageddon. We need $750 billion immediately based on this one-page memo that gives us all your money and with no strings. And uh, Lehman Brothers fails, Bear Stearns fails. People are saying, my God, this is the end. And uh, within a couple of days, the commercial paper market starts to get active again. There's a little bit more juice, things happen. Comes out later that the cash to get the economy rolling again came from the Mexican drug lords. <laughs> the same cash. So uh, this is the only real money in circulation. That is stuff that you can hold on to. Get the economy gone!